All right, this will be the third and uh, last uh, lecture here. So I'm trying to string it on um, on uh, the 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 skills acquisition sort of research. Then uh, again, we got three different interpretations of this um, from three different writers on what uh, K. Anders Ericsson's original um, research. And today we're going to get, uh, get to the you know ubiquitous uh, Malcolm Gladwell who is and it's going to be this book um, Outliers uh, he's, he's written um, and again Gladwell first uh, came to prominence uh, at you know uh, with a book uh, called uh, what was it uh, The Tipping Point um, uh, every year years back it was, it was a huge basically studying you know what makes fads happen what makes you know it induces popular how do things get popular it was kind of, kind of a fascinating he likes to tackle these sort of a uh, uh, very difficult uh, um, sort of abstract concepts and then see if he can't uh, uh, flush them out and then, and then tease them out and has had, you know, a certain amount of success. He's had his critics, too, um, Malcolm Gladwell. Well, some of it deserved, some of it maybe not. And I, I do find them, uh, Gladwell, kind of uh, uh, fascinating. Um, anyway, we've had, you know, this is now going to be the third. Uh, we had uh, Robert Greene, right, who took uh, Erickson's research and kind of ran it through an evolutionary lens. We had then... Uh, Cal Newport, who did it through a very basic sort of economics 101, you know, supply-demand uh, sort of lens. And um, I guess, you know, uh, Gladwell's the one I'm maybe shoehorning uh, into putting into a theory here, because I don't think this is, ex this is a bit inexact. But I might say this is a little bit, uh, he, he is using a little bit of maybe postmodern uh, theory lens. And it won't, essentially that um, there's a certain amount of... Um, luck involved in people who get extremely successful and that is the sort of thing he, he you know he does do the 10 he also focuses on the 10,000 hour part which we'll do here um, but he also uh, that uh, you know privilege and that uh, certain uh, cer some people have more privilege in, uh, than others and I do think that is an important thing to at least acknowledge um, that it's not the most inspirational thing in the world to, uh, to, to think about but we can't um, I, you know, maybe start out with something like my, you know, Michael Jordan, right? Who was a, a, a kid who was, I don't, um, I don't know what kind of household exactly Jordan grew up with, but um, I do know that uh, you know, fa the famous story about Jordan is that he didn't uh, make his high school team. He was cut. I think he wasn't, but he didn't make the, the varsity, I guess he got put on JV when he was a sophomore. Um, never got, by the way, never got over it. I literally had the guy who got picked over him and the coach who didn't pick him uh, to the Hall of Fame speech and just chastised him before a, a captive audience. It was, I was, it was just the most ungracious <laughs> fucking Hall of Fame speech I'd ever seen. It was insane. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, listen, Michael Jordan's um, drive and his his ambition was legendary um that he he wanted it more than anyone wanted it again his 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 will and his drive is is like uh you know the if if that's like the only thing you care about he is your platonic ideal for that right um and that he you know he had a, he had a he had his house built with a basketball court literally a full-size basketball court in the basement he used to make his uh teammates come over and practice on the days they didn't have practice he was he, he was a lunatic you know how, how how driven he was and how much it just killed him if he didn't if he if he didn't win how competitive he was uh but and, and, and yeah and in that you know maybe that made him the greatest basketball player who ever lived uh, according to most people who follow the sport and that might be true uh but uh one thing about michael jordan you have to remember he was uh i think six foot six uh, which is not huge by the way by basketball standards but that still puts you in the uh, top one uh, or two, I think top one percentile among all men, um, and, and say American men. So, you know, in the single physical trait that would give you the greatest competitive advantage for the sport he chose to play, he was in the, you know, one or two or three percentile. Um, so, you know what? 
all you'd have to do to Michael Jordan to change his life is chop a foot. You know, let's make him five foot six instead of six foot six. And you know what? None of us would have ever heard of Michael Jordan. And that's the fucking truth. Uh, and listen, would a drive like that? He might have done something with himself, though. Maybe would have uh, uh, had a string of uh, successful car dealerships and made himself a millionaire or went into some other business, maybe some other sport. Maybe he would have been good enough to play in the NBA anyway. And even, you know, been like an all-star caliber player. That's not, that's very difficult to do at five six. But it's, it, there was a guy five seven, Spud Webb, who once won the slam dunk uh, competition. But Spud Webb didn't go on to become a Hall of Fame player. Uh, so, so anyway, there is a certain amount of uh, uh, undeserved uh, good fortune that comes upon uh, people who are uber successful. And I do think Gladwell is right to shine some focus on that. Uh, but I think the first thing I think uh, Gladwell uh, gets into is the 10,000 hours uh, rule, which is a bit of a loose rule. This has become a little bit controversial uh, when uh, Erickson died recently. But uh, when Canaris Erickson was alive, he was not totally thrilled uh, with the way Glad he thought Gladwell uh, oversimplified uh, for the 10,000 hour rule for, excuse me, for Erickson was a mean, you know, this was the sort of average, but there were a lot of people that fell short of that, you know, that took less time to get to the mastery, and there are a lot of people who did double that before they reached it, and some that never reached it, so... I think Gladwell wrote it in a way, and I do think this is a fair criticism, even if he didn't mean it that way, that it could be uh, sort of interpreted... Um, as you just put your 10,000 hours in and you, and, and you get it. Oh, that, that's also, by the way, I just now uh, did what uh, yeah, Gladwell's being accused of. Yeah, Glad Gladwell was a little more subtle, by the way, than that. It was supposed to be fair to him. Um, and again, Glad Malcolm Gladwell's a, 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 a fascinating writer. I, I, I always recommend him. He anyway, uh, the ten so the ten thousand hours, which is it's about how long it takes to sort of attain mastery, and he in a very fascinating way uh, in this chapter, um, he, he gives uh, three examples: Bill Joy, uh, Bill Gates, and the Beatles, um, and all the things that uh, happen and that they yes, they were all extremely driven. They all put those ten thousand hours in. Uh, but also, there was a certain amount of good fortune that even allowed them their 10,000 hours. And I do think it's a spectac this is a spectacular chapter, man. I mean, I, I, if you're uh, a writer who wants to be a, a nonfiction writer, one of these, write these uh, big ideas, or even lowercase, and I would consider his uh, Gladwell books, like the big, big idea books, or, you know, Sapiens, Guns, Germs, and Steel, or uh, uh, Pinker's, you know, the, the, the Bitter Angels of Our Nature. Uh, um, and I think there's a sort of uh, some uh, a lot of also fascinating sort of lowercase ones anyway. Gladwell and uh, Michael Lewis uh, that are a lot of really cool smart writers uh, that are excellent story excellent writers and excellent storytellers and are fun to read that write some of these books too. All right. Um, I won't get into. I'm gonna uh, the, by the Bill. A lot of crossover with Bill Joy and Bill Gates. So I'm just gonna focus on Bill Gates' story, and then uh, we'll do the Beatles, which is a, a, a fun one. It really is. Um, and basically, Bill Gates uh, was a young man who um, precocious kid was a special kid was brilliant. He was all these things, um, and uh, he be, he you know when this is growing up in the seventies when computers are still brand new, and it was sort of a time when you know. The kind of computational power in our iPhones. Um, it took one of those gigantic, noisy uh, machines, you know, that needed a full room, you know, just to house it, and you know, a certain you know, amount of air conditioning to keep the room cool enough, and everything else. And it was it was was uh, sort of noisy. So you know, we're a long way from the world we're living in now. Uh, and people needed to program these things. And programming it was it really was like learning, it literally was uh, learning a language. Um, but he was fascinated by computers, Bill Gates, and he, he decide, you know, he, he did, he does decide to, um, you know, he pursues it, um, but his parents, and, uh, he does some things like, I mean, he, at one point, I think as a 14 year old boy, he's sneaking out of his bedroom, and again, not to go see a girl, but to, uh, you know, uh, walk down to, he lived within walking distance, I guess, of a uh, University of Washington, I think I, not Harvard Center, I, I college anyway, um, and that, that, that was nearby, and then had, very few colleges even had these sort of computers, there's only like 10 of them in the country or something, he happened to live near one of them, um, and, 
and anyway, he he went. You know, and, and before that, by the way, he'd gone to a uh, some, either a private school or a sort of magnet uh, type school where uh, um, you know there you know there was they were well off. Uh, his his family was you know solidly upper middle. They weren't rich, but they were solidly upper middle class. And he went to a kind of school where all the other kids were sort of so, you know they were fairly comfortable economic. They were not struggling to make ends meet. And uh, because he went to a school like that, the, you know the the mothers would get together and uh, throw bake sales and things to raise money whenever they get in. They did that for, so the kids could get a couple of the kids got into the computers and they can get computers. One of the kids' fathers worked for an early computer company. So they got free computers. So there was all these sort of good, fortunate things that happened that he got to his hands on computers when it was very difficult to. Um, he was uh, the school ended up letting him uh, design his own sort of a class where he then could basically just learn coding on his own at this. Now that was now we're back to that college where he was walking to, um, and uh, and so he was getting good. He was just working at it, learning how to make the computer do things, learning. And again, he he also did have the the work ethic and the and the sort of obsession with it too um but they get you know the, the school said yes to things parents sort of bought it there was all there was like five or six of these little uh, uh instances of good fortune in, in, in bill gates's life uh, until this point and then we get to where he's sneaking out it's uh, i think from like two to four in the morning or some crazy thing like that uh where he was uh, all alone and he just was uh, learning how to code, learning how to code. And I guess he, he designed some sort of thing to work uh, traffic signals or something. And um, then all of it, you know, and he got to know the guy. And again, very few people are studying computers at this point. Um, and uh, so the kid, you know, as it turned out, uh, there was some company that needed a, a, a computer program written for them. And the guy who ran the lab uh, knew, you know, the, the, the two best programmers we knew were these two kids. He's like, you know, they could... And so he ends up getting a gig, you know, designing software for this, you know, uh, for a corporate, and that's what gets him going. Um, so all these sort of, you know, again, he, you know, he didn't, you know, he happened to live within walking distance to that place. Uh, that place, you know, uh, the guy who, who ran the computer lab happened to kind of take a shine to him. Uh, the, and then, you know, that company ended up calling the computer lab. He ends up getting hired for that thing. And anyway, that kind of gets him off and running. And so the, anyway, there were, there were just all, you know, and before that, he had that private school where he was exposed you know he had exposure to computers a few times and so by the time he's actually starts you know he drops out of harvard um his freshman year to start microsoft um he'd already put in his ten thousand hours and almost nobody and again he had an unusual drive bill gates no doubt about it but you know what we're a country of 300 million people there were certainly at least a thousand kids across this country that had that kind of drive uh there might not have been you know ten thousand but there were definitely a thousand um and but he happened to be the one of those thousand that you know lived you know that happened to have you know com you know get, get his hands on computers even in high school happened to have a very sort of uh, progressive forward-thinking high school that let him uh design his own sort of classes sometimes in, in, with computers and then happened to live close enough to you know to be able to walk to and get all kinds of free practice time on computers when no one else was getting so he just got this huge uh advantage and and, and got way out ahead of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people that way and so again yes driven worked hard got his ten thousand hours also though and to become the bill you know and again you can become successful without becoming bill gates uh but get the uh, to be, you know sort of like uh you can get a professorship or um uh, you know, uh, you could become a million. You could work your way to becoming a millionaire if that's what you're determined to do. Uh, to become a billionaire, you know, you need a you know you need a, a bit of luck, a bit of outside luck too. Isn't that's that's uh, that uh, uh, attaining something like that isn't completely uh, within your your control. All right, we'll move on to the Beatles example, which is actually probably the more fun one, and that was that uh, you know the, the you know the boys from Liverpool they um. Uh, rock and roll obsessed a lot of your buddy holly and little richard and uh, all of whom you can hear all those are uh, early pioneers of rock and roll the 50s american rock and roll musicians elvis yeah sort of especially in those early uh those early records of the beatles um but they weren't really anything all that special for a while uh there uh but they do have a couple of you know they, they, they did have some talent especially their their two frontmen right lennon and mccartney um uh, although the others you know regularly were no, were no slouches either uh, but what what does happen to them is uh, their manager takes on you know a, a gig he finds him a gig and uh, somebody needed a 
a house band for their bar in Germany. This was in the red light district. So this was a strip joint, right? Uh, and they go to Hamburg uh, and they've been playing, you know, quite a bit. And again, you had very driven guys here, uh, guys who were obsessed with music, you know, right? Uh, um, more so probably than most of the people around them. Uh, but they also had a bit of good fortune that uh, this, this German uh, strip joint was looking for a band to play like eight hours a day. It was almost unheard of for a band to play that that, that that much. And so they go there and they're playing and again, they're, you know, I think they're like 19, 20, 22, something in that, you know, uh, late teens, early 20s. Um, you know, and they're they get to play eight hours of rock and roll and a bar full of, you know, naked girls. I mean, you know, what a, <laughs> when, 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 when young men, they were probably just fine with that situation. Uh, but also, when you had to play eight hours, you have to play eight hours for people who don't necessarily speak English, most of them. It's in Germany. And it was called the Hamburg Crucible. And it's sort of a fascinating uh, story where, and there were some great quotes there where Lennon, you know, John Lennon years later said, he was like, we, we you know, basically weren't very good at all when we went there. We were tight as hell when we left. Um, He's like, we had to just really throw ourselves into it. We had to learn, they had to learn all kinds of new uh, songs. They, they started playing around with different kinds of styles of music, which they then later on incorporated, which, which seasoned and flavored their music uh, in a way that, that others didn't have. Uh, they also learned to be able to just sort of look at each other and give the slightest nod to you know change the tempo and move. And they, they, they became a much tighter uh, musical unit there. Um, they didn't, and again, they didn't just play their greatest hits, which is, by the way, what you do when you're playing gigs out there, uh, you want to, you know, you want to get the next gig at that bar. So you just play those five or, you know, back then, I think it was literally less than 10 songs you'd play in a night and you just, uh, go on and you, you play your best every single night. Yeah. You'd get best better at those. Uh, but when you have to play eight hours, um, your your you know the catalog of songs expands massively, and even the you know you play more jazz and more blues and all kinds of this country and all different kinds of styles of music that you're then gonna you're going back and forth. So they just they got so much um, uh, sort of experience there, and, um, and you know and you know they they came out uh, great. Um, they went in okay, uh, and it was the making of them, according to the according to themselves and other observers. And um, they again, I think that was sixty two, sixty three. It was two years later, nineteen sixty four, is when they, you know, Beatlemania exploded onto America. So it's kind of a fascinating uh, little uh, um, little story there. And Gladwell, it was, it was a, that, that very well picked by uh, Gladwell. All right, uh, that'll do it for that, and uh, we'll see you next time.